anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. Come on, come on, come on, we gotta get out of here. We gotta get Welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm your host, Frank. I'm joined here with my good friend, Julian of the Chronicles of the Maid of Lorraine, and Andrew, a good friend of ours here. Uh, and on the line, calling all the way from Austria, a very special guest, our good friend, Mr. Charles Colomb, historian Charles Colomb. He is the author of the book, Blessed Charles of Austria, A Holy Emperor and His Legacy. He is also the author of Vickers of Christ, A History of the Popes. And you can watch his podcast weekly with his partner, Vincent Franchini, entitled Off the Menu. And I do highly recommend it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Charles Colomb, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Frank. Great to be back. Uh, it's great to have you. Our first our first time we met and did an interview here went fantastic. Our audience loved it. And, uh, you know, great to have you back. You know, tonight, Mr. Colon, we'd like to ask you about, you know, the Enlightenment and sort of 18th and 19th century revolutions and how it affects us today. But as you know, we got a massive controversy in the 2020 American election here, and there are heads spinning and confusion and People are just losing faith in the system left and right right now. But, you know, we, we, we got a massive recount going on in the American election right now. People, there's rumors of lots of rampant uh, irregularities in the American vote. What are you hearing out there in Austria and what are your general thoughts about what's happened here in 2020? Well, <laughs> I, uh, I'll tell you what, it's a real, a real uh, head scratcher. Uh, you know, the thing about any voting process is that the more complex you make it, the easier it is to manipulate. That's that's very simple. Uh, the, it, it's it's kind of something of a no-brainer. Uh, when you add uh, mail-in votes, odd-line votes, uh, you you can vo your vote counts uh, as long as it gets in by um, you know by uh, as long as it's postmarked. By election day, I mean, the problem is the more complex you make the system, the easier it is to manipulate it. Uh, a fairly straightforward: you go in on election day, you present your ID, you checked off, you vote, you scram. You know what? If you can't get in, if you're going to be out of town, if you're me, and yes, I voted by mail because I can, but honestly, if it were up to me, I wouldn't be able to. Why? Because I'm in Austria, and it would be too easy to fake my vote to do funny things. I mean, look, you may remember in the Detroit area about, oh, gosh, five or six years ago, famous story. This uh, lady uh, lived in a house which was uh, automatically paid for. Apparently, she had some money uh, because the rent uh, to the bank, the mortgage, whatever it was, the payment went every month automatically from her account. Well, one day the account ran out, and so the bank foreclosed, and they sent somebody to check it out, and they found her dead in her car, and it turned out hey. she had been sitting there dead for about seven years. Well, the only thing funnier than that was the fact that she had voted four years previously. <laughs> uh, now, I don't want to say that there was fraud involved. Uh, she might have been reaching out from beyond, you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> Certainly in Mayor Daley's Chicago, the dead regularly rose to vote for the living, uh, which I think is a beautiful thing if you can manage it. But uh, this is the problem. So a setup such uh, as we have right now, especially given the divisions of the country, given the, the complete opposition, there was no way this election was going to be easy or clean or simple. Just, yeah. you know, how do I how do I say this? If you jump in a mud bath, you're going to get up dirty. <laughs> you know, it it you you could not possibly 
have an election like this with so much riding on it and such an intricate, bizarre collection of voting procedures without, A, laying it open for fraud, and therefore, B, laying it open for dispute. Now, I would like to, however, point something out, and that is uh, on November 8th, which incidentally is my 60th birthday, for those who are keeping score, uh, it's also the 60th anniversary of the election of John F. Kennedy. Now, there was very strong evidence after that election that thanks to JFK and, uh, sorry, LBJ in Texas and Mayor Daley in Chicago, the dead had risen sufficiently to uh, get JFK those two states, Texas and Illinois. Nixon was in a position to challenge it. Now, to show you how different the world was then, Nixon refused. And he said, and he actually wrote in response to his advisors, that uh, the, da- the amount of damage to the system that calling the voting thing into question would do was far worse than anything a Kennedy administration could do to the country. Now, that just tells you where we were in 1960. It was a totally different universe, a totally different world. The issues were not what they are now. The two parties agreed on things like, oh, I don't know, what's marriage? What's a human being? What's a gender? You know, there, there, there was a basic moral consensus on reality. Now, the two sides do not live in the same universe. And to make things even worse, uh, because the Supreme Court is now the most powerful uh, element of government, it's the third house of the, or actually the first house of Congress, it's all and nothing, uh, getting control of it, and that means getting control of the presidency, is the most important thing anyone can do. So the, the whole thing is very toxic, very poisonous. Into all of this, you inject these convoluted voting structures uh, that, as I say, lend themselves to fraud, no voter ID. Oh, and, and by the way, for those of you who are concerned that demanding voter ID is racist, uh, why isn't it then, why do I have to have ID when I drive a car? Why are driver's licenses equally racist? How about yes. bank cards? Uh, you know, you know, we, we live in this fantasy world that the problem is that everything is coming home to roost with it. Because what will happen is if the thing goes to the courts and the president is uh, is reelected, the Democrats will undoubtedly refuse to recognize his legitimacy simply because they'll say he created the court that put him in. Uh, that was the potential problem with appointing, you know, appointing the uh, uh, the justice that he appointed. I mean, mind you, I'm glad he did. That's not my point. But it ensured that if the thing went to the courts, as seemed likely at the time, that the other side would be able to cry foul. Now, having said that, uh, there's enough ambiguity and so forth left that if uh, Mrs. Harris does end up as president, uh, then there's enough bizarrity and, and ambiguity for the reverse to happen. So we're stuck in a situation, gentlemen, where however, it, however it, it turns out, half the country is going to regard the sitting president as illegitimate. That, yeah. that is a recipe for sheer and utter disaster. Yes, I think, too, uh, Mr. Colomb, it's different than the 2000 uh, fiasco we had here with the Bush-Gore election, because I think from that standpoint, Bush had the lead uh, in many of those states. Well, in Florida, had the lead in Florida, and it was a matter of protecting that lead uh, from the Gore administration trying to conjure up the votes they needed to win. But if we got a situation here where we have massive fraud and we actually have states that have to reverse some ballot counting or change some numbers, that's going to have a different optic. I think it's going to be a critical moment here if, 
for some reason, um, Joe Biden is declared to get 270 electoral votes. He's going to come out right away, declare victory, and declare he's putting his transition team together. And then we have to go to litigation to reverse the 270 at some point because of the, the massive corruption. That's going to be chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be an incredible mess. And the, um, the best advice I can give anybody is stay sane. Yeah. Resist the resist the impulse to go crazy, um, and you know if you find yourself at the if you find a mob uh, on your tail, remind them that they may be a mob as a group to wreck and ruin, but they'll die as individuals. <laughs> I I mean I, I hate to sound I hate to sound like a laughing death's head, but the truth is that. We are going into uncharted waters, and it. I pray to God that that people keep their heads, and that okay. things get sorted out. I want to let I Julian. Have, I have a question about that, if if I could, Frank, if that's all right. That's so, uh, how much of this 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 is what I find really interesting? How much of this is actually uncharted waters, and, and like, what is it specifically about our situation right here in history? That, that makes this so different from the revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. You know, what weren't the information, wasn't information tightly controlled? Didn't the newspapers, didn't, didn't, didn't they play critical roles in the, um, you know, in the civil war, in the revolutionary war, in the war of 1789? Didn't well, they, the uh, didn't education, wasn't that corrupted first? Wasn't philosophy really kind of leading the uh, leading the way that's all true but when I say we're in we're in uncharted waters I mean in living memory uh, in the United States and of course what you say is absolutely true and I mean we are in the hallmarks uh, we're, we're, we're in a situation that bears all the earmarks of uh, as they like to say a world historic event these things of course happen throughout history it's just it's the first one for most of us uh and it's happening here it's not happening in france it's not happening in central europe it's not happening in latin america i mean uh people live through this sort of thing and they often live with it uh people have lived in banana republics uh since the uh, beginning of uh, republicanism in the 18th century but we have not been used to being a banana republic now we're going to find out what it's like i suppose do you have a dog in this fight, Mr. Cologne? Of course, I've got a dog in the fight. Uh, I was born in the United States, you know. I, okay. <laughs> what, I have a dog in this fight. I wore the uniform and swore the oath. Um, mind you, it was in peacetime, back in the days, uh, those palmy, far-off days of the 1980s, when we were able to say, "Sleep all, America. Your National Guard does." But <laughs> those those days, I'm afraid, are gone forever. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my father was a tail gunner in uh, the Army Air Corps against the Japanese. Uh, I, my, uh, my father's family uh, have been in the States since the 1880s. Uh, so, yeah, I've got a dog in the fight. It's the country that, in which I was born. Uh, right. I, now, mind you, her institutions I may have a lot of trouble with. The national ideology I certainly have a lot of trouble with. But the country itself, the land that invented both the cocktail and the polio vaccine, <laughs> uh, I, I could, I've had both, and I can tell you which I prefer. But, uh, <laughs> but honestly, of course I've got a dog in this fight. Every, every Catholic American has a dog in the fight. But the problem is we've let things go so long in so many ways. Uh, we took not rocking the boat as being patriotism. We had, uh, at the very early early days of our nation's history, America's Catholics made a sort of tacit agreement with the powers that be that we would not seriously try to evangelize in response for some, in response, uh, in return, rather, for some sort of uh, recognition. And the day I was born, was the apogee of that kind of Catholicism, the day John F. Kennedy was elected. 
we had one of our own in the White House. And it's been downhill for both the country and the church ever since. Uh, I, I hope my, my birth didn't play a part in that precipitate decline. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, uh, first and foremost, I will tell you that we Catholics, we Catholic Americans failed our country. That's a hard thing to say, but it's true. We were never interested in. Uh, we were never interested in uh, converting the nation. We only wanted a place at the table. As a result, not only did we not convert the country, we lost what place we've had. And now, it was such a joke that our churches could be closed by fiat, and our leadership will go along with it. If you think Dagger John Hughes is still alive, you're very much mistaken. We've got a few bishops who are very strong men, but if only a few. And yet, I can't condemn them because they match their laity. It's not like we're any great shakes ourselves. I'm old enough to remember Operation Rescue. This was a marvelous thing, and it, for a short while, it had abortion on the run. And then, and then it all fizzled. Combination of judicial action and, I'm sorry to say it, lack of Episcopal support. Um, you know, what, what can I tell you? We are, we are reaping what we have sown. And not just Catholic Americans, of course. Americans of all stripes. Uh, you look, for instance, in the, in the, uh, over this past summer, the, de the, the sickening declarations of wokeness that have come out from all of our learned societies and various scientific organizations and so forth. A horrendous declaration of hatred of the, of the very country itself. We're terrible, it's systemic racism, and, and everything is awful. And there's got to be a reckoning. Well, okay, all right. We're getting the reckoning, my friends. It won't be a reckoning you like, though. Yeah, we certainly are. Um, Julian, check your mic there, Julian. Uh, Mr. Colomb, um, I guess this is why we brought you on here, because we want to talk to you about the grand revolution of the past 250 years since the alignment, because I think what we're talking about here is all interrelated. And I think when we look at, for example, something like the French Revolution that really, well, it, it's a dark period in, in European history, obviously, but I think it lays the path really for a future in many respects. Um, when we look at the enlightenment in general, though, can Catholics baptize it? Or is there something we have to pull back deeper from history in order to make sort of Catholic civilization work? Well, you know, you can't really baptize the Enlightenment because it, how do I put this? The problem with the Enlightenment is that its major religious component was what we call deism. The idea that there is a creator of sorts, but uh, he has no interest in our lives. He's not personal. The, the Enlightenment had a, had a tremendous antagonism toward uh, revealed religion of any kind, and Catholicism in particular. Now, what's to be gotten out of that? You know, uh, maybe tactics in terms of subversion. <laughs> you know, you can learn something from the enemy that way. But I mean, honestly, what did the chief of police or, or the mayor of Chicago have to learn from Al Capone? Uh it's the same position that Catholics are on with regard to the Enlightenment. There is an opposition there that no amount of language can obfuscate, although we have tried to for 200 years. And we had, we did, to be fair, we had better reason to do so in America than in France because the Enlightenment in America had the auspicious byproduct of giving us freedom, which in France, of course, was just the opposite. You see, the thing to bear in mind is that Anglo-American liberalism on the one hand and continental liberalism, i.e. French, Latin American, Italian, Spanish, and so forth, they are different not in uh, kind but in degree. Anglo-American liberalism 
uh, that variant of the Enlightenment can afford to be tolerant of Catholicism simply because in the Anglosphere, Catholicism is, has always been too weak to be a threat, at least since the aftermath of the Reformation. Uh, and in America, as I say, we, we weren't going to try to challenge the regime anyway. We'd go along with everything. So sure, we could get along with the Enlightenment as long as we knew our place, as long as we didn't evangelize. The problem for the Catholic faith, however, is that we can't make that kind of a deal with the devil and live long. You see, Catholicism can't simply sit in stasis in any given place. It must either expand or decrease. It has no other choice. Um, in France, of course, in Italy, Latin America, the Enlightenment was obviously and very definitely the enemy of the faith. It did everything it could to destroy us uh, in Mexico and France and so on and so on. Spanish Civil War. But in the end, they were not as successful as the Anglo-American style has been. Because here, we learn to love our change, you see. We learn to think that uh, it was okay that our country was not Catholic. And it was okay not to evangelize. In other words, social acceptance, uh, acceptance of the ideals of the Enlightenment, conduct over creed, were more important than following Christ's great commission. Uh, you know, you're supposed to uh, love the Lord thy God above all things, thy neighbor is thyself, not thy neighbor above thy God. So, um, but to answer your question, yes, of course, we have to rediscover our Catholic faith. We have to rediscover our Catholic culture, bearing in mind, of course, that we are not living in 15th century France. We're not living in 17th century Spain. We are living in what we're living in, the wreckage that is 21st century America. And we have to accept the fact that it is a heathen country and look at it the way Catholics have always looked at countries that they're trying to evangelize. They get to know them very, very well. They get to know their culture very, very well. And then they try to baptize it. I wonder if it's not, um, if it's not, not a baptism question, but more of a, a penance question that, yeah, we were never a Catholic country. No. Uh, officially and and there was a lot of i mean we were officially a protestant country really but um i i mean a lot of protestants are baptized and technically according to the definition are actually catholic um but they just don't even they don't even realize it they and i, I think a lot of that stems from kind of morally a refusal to recognize where you failed which is oh. the, the essence of penance i and I guess I look at that as as the, maybe the fundamental issue with our with American society right now is we will not square up to mistakes. We no. refuse to recognize when we've spoken error. Like no one, no one will go back and say, "Yeah, you know what? I was wrong about that." I want to make sure everybody knows um, because truth is more important than my reputation. And so what I, I guess so what what has ended up happening is even our reputation internationally is just trash we have nothing that we stand for anymore um kind of globally as a as a nation and really individually the way we interact with each other there's there's very little honor even of the most um you know even in the the most natural sense so i i don't i don't want to sound all doom and gloom but but i wonder if if we can't identify the problem a little bit maybe a little bit more specifically with the, the wisdom of the faith and, and the light that we have. It's, it's, it's not that we don't know better. It's that we refuse to recognize what we know. Well, uh, that's very true. Uh, you know, my little joke, if it's a joke, is that if you want to love the United States, really adore her, get in a car and drive through her. If you want to hit a, you know, a long way, long trip, see a lot of things. If you want to hate the United States, study the history of our foreign policy. Uh, 
it's a very sad story. Uh, from the very beginning, from the 1820s, uh, when we were able to exert any kind of, of force in Latin America, we always backed the anti-Catholic side in any dispute. And of course, having just written this book on Blessed Emperor Carl, we were one of the long list, and, and in the end, the most important list of people who uh, betrayed or did him in. Um, and that, the worst of it is, it wouldn't be, I can't say it wouldn't be so bad, but it would be more understandable if we ever benefited out of behaving in that fashion. But we always end up paying a price for it. Uh, the price for our, our malfeasance at the end of World War I was, at least according to Winston Churchill, who you can't accuse of being pro-German, uh, the, the thing that gave us World War II was Wilson's insistence on getting rid of the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns and the rest. And he did so because he hated the church and he hated monarchy. He was a good Presbyterian, former president of Princeton, and the epitome of an Enlightenment individual. But you're right. I mean, there has to be that kind of a reckoning. Uh, but how, you know, you, you can't even get there until the majority of Americans have a moral sense for, for which to make that, that jump. You can't have penance unless you're aware that you've done wrong. True. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, the the problem we're 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 in a setup now, and this is perhaps a slightly vulgar example, but it, it brings it home anyway. Uh, whenever I hear the phrase "modern moral sensibilities," I'm reminded of the Madame of a Bordello, who is absolutely outraged that the girls in her employer are smoking after work. Oh, oh, I know what they're doing. I know afterwards they go out and they light up because I can smell the tobacco. Uh, <laughs> Madam, Madam, are are you aware of what kind of a business you run here? Yes. What about it? And I know they're smoking. I know they are. Well, that is for a lot of us, and not just people who consider themselves liberal. That is the moral sense we have. So how do you get to people like that and say, hey, as a society, we've done wrong. As a society, our hands are red with the blood of infants. And we're more like Carthage than Rome. How do you get them to see that in a minute? Well, the only way you can, and this goes back to evangelizing, it's more than just baptizing, evangelizing. It is instructing them in the faith. There, If you don't have that, you don't have, you have no moral understanding. There was a time when the inherited moral capital of old Christendom still survived in non-Catholic America. It was one of the things that allowed the country to function. But that's shattered in the 60s. Hmm. And I, I, you see, the problem is, there will be a solution, gentlemen. There will be. One way or the other, everything we're looking at right now is going to resolve itself. But when I say that, I don't mean to say in a necessarily a nice way. Rome's issues were resolved. The barbarians came in, <laughs> erected kingdoms on imperial soil, and uh, that was the beginning of modern Europe after they were converted. But if you were an imperial Roman patriot, I don't know if you consider that the best solution. But it was a solution. It happened. Yeah. Julian, you have a question? I'm sorry? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure that yes, my mic is not muted. Uh, ahead, Julian. So uh, earlier you talked about uh, ID. I just want to let you know I have my passport and my driver's license, and every single time I go to the bank, they ask me for one. So... I don't understand why it's so hard to, when I go vote, to just ask me for my ID. I, I don't understand, but I, uh, I'd, I'd, make a, I'd make a big deal of it at the bank, and I'd say, "What do they, What do you? What do you mean? I don't need ID to vote." I, I know, right? That's what I would do. Racist. Uh, that's what I would say. Racist. No, I know. I really should actually. 
Um, you kind of answered one of my questions, so it makes my one of my questions superfluous. Uh, uh, it was a I was going to ask about the revolution and the so-called American Revolution, the French Revolution and the so-called American Revolution, and which one is more um, influential on society, more damaging, I guess. But I think what I'll actually ask is, have you, are you familiar with the, with the book, Liberalism is a Sin? It's, it's a, there's two books that bear the same title. One is by a Spanish parish priest, and another is by a French cardinal. Uh, how do you think that plays into the church and how we should view politics? And what is it, you know, I posted on my Facebook, uh, how are people loving liberalism? Do you still want to embrace it? And then one Catholic who I know personally said, liberalism isn't the problem, leftism is. And then I said, Liberalism gives us leftism. If there's no liberalism, there's no leftism. So why is it that Catholics, even Catholics who are Orthodox in their practice, don't see the problems of liberalism and, and that it's pernicious and to embrace any bit of it is to their own detriment? Well, you have to go back to the 19th century and actually the uh, late 18th century, uh, something called Americanism. Um, basically, uh, how do I put this? From the very beginning, when John Carroll was appointed uh, Bishop of Baltimore, uh, many Catholics have felt that embracing our national liberalism, the fruit of the Enlightenment and our first civil war, the American Revolution, so-called, embracing that was necessary to be patriotic. Because again, and this this is a, pro, a, a very large problem uh, that is not just for Catholics, unfortunately. But when the revolution was accomplished, apart from that moral consensus I spoke of, uh, and their shared loyalty to the king, the uh, the colonies had not really had any bond of unity. After the revolution, the loyalty to the king was gone, and to replace it, a sort of religion of the country was developed, which was a kind of deified liberalism, you know, uh, and men like John Carroll, his brother Daniel, who was the uh, Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Maryland, and their cousin Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, none of his children married Catholics, although that didn't bother him, and none of his direct descendants, except for a few converts, being Catholic today. Um, American Catholics in the very beginning wanted to conform and believed that it was their duty, that were bearing in mind that patriotism is in fact a religious virtue. They believed it, uh, embracing the national liberalism to be part and parcel of being a loyal and faithful American. Well, what they would not let themselves see is that there was a basic problem between the national liberalism and their religious faith. Uh, they allowed themselves the, the luxury of, well, I think it was Richard Brookhiser who put it best, of course the Catholic Church was still the one true church, but still were all the others. <laughs> and, and that, uh, that was reinforced uh, after the Civil War by, of course, the, the conspicuous Catholic service, both in that conflict on both sides, and in the, uh, the First and Second World Wars. Uh, the Americanist heresy, so-called, arose in the late 19th century when, uh, in response to armies of Catholic immigrants who arrived from all over Europe, from Latin America, from Quebec, a lot of shifty people came down from Quebec, including my great-grandfather. You know, you, you can't trust those guys. Uh, <laughs> They, they gave us both Jack Kerouac and the lady who wrote Peyton Place. So, you know, this, we're, we're not a trustworthy folk. But anyway, you have, all these, you have all these foreigners come running in. What do you do? Well, the Irish-American Catholic hierarchy believed it was their role to Americanize them, quote-unquote. They also came to believe that the church in America, because it was brought up around democracy, 
was and ought to be different from the church of the rest of the world. Well, that was condemned by Leo XIII as the heresy of Americanism, but nevertheless, it continued to be extremely important, so much so that certain American Catholic theologians, most notably John Courtney Murray, SJ, came to regard the work of the Founding Fathers and so on as on the almost equal to Scripture. And this this view he brought out in a uh, book called We Hold These Truths. Now, the reason why John Courtney Murray SJ is very, very important for everybody is that he was one of the major uh, drafters, the documents of church, on church and state at Vatican II. Uh, we had a very big influence, uh, the Americans. Uh, this is all by way of answering your question. Why do so many otherwise devout American Catholics not understand that liberalism is a sin? It's because they believe that adherence to liberalism is part and parcel of being a loyal American. But mind you, a lot of Americans feel that way, and unfortunately it has a reverse effect too, and you're seeing this with the war correct. The idea is this. The United States, are ah, the shining city on the hill, the last best hope of mankind. Uh, American exceptionalism, we're wonderful. But what if we're not? Because love of country is completely bound up for people with this mindset, with the truth of that para-religion of the country, if their faith in it is shaken or destroyed, their love of country goes right out the window. The idea that America is not an ideology, not an idea, but a concrete place that we actually come from with a very weird and twisted and problematic history, kind of like every other country that's ever existed, because they're all made up of fallen people. Nevertheless, it's worthy of our love and devotion simply because it is our country, not because of Washington crossing the Delaware not because of uh, the Star-Spangled Banner or the Emancipation Proclamation, not because of Teddy Roosevelt on San Juan Hill. No. It's deserving of our love because from all eternity, God saw fit to put us here, either by birth or because we came for whatever reason. That's why you love your country. And that goes back to the earlier question from Frank about whether I have a dog in this fight. But you see, I think that what we lack and then our great Achilles heel, both Catholic and non-Catholic in this country, really is a true patriotism, a love of the country in and of itself. And for the Catholic in the non-Catholic country, and this is true if he's in America, India, Japan, China, the way he has to show his love of country is by trying to bring it to Christ and the church. Otherwise, he is no real patriot. Otherwise, he yaps. He's a talker. But the the martyrs in Rome, the martyrs under, under Henry VIII and Elizabeth, the martyrs of the French Revolution, they were patriots for their countries. They were real patriots. The Korean martyrs, the Chinese martyrs, the Japanese martyrs, the Thai martyrs in World War II. They were the real patriots. Uh, and we have to understand that. What did St. Thomas More say? I am the king's good servant, but God's first. He was a loyal Englishman. Not Cramner, not all the sycophants around the king. Thomas More, St. John Fisher, they were the patriots in 15 and 34. They were the real loyal subjects to the king. Well, it's that way for us. If we simply play, say the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, you know, bring us back to the Constitution and old glory, we're lying. Our country needs much more than that. You know, one of the things that hit me very much when I was listening to uh, uh, Mr. Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore it was an impressive speech for so far as it ran. 
And, you know, I'm sure he believed it. But what struck me was that it would have been boilerplate for politicians of either party when I was a kid. What's happened is that that American religion of which I spoke has now simply become a party platform. And it's not held by the other side. Now, it might have been somewhat erroneous to begin with, but it was all we had. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, <laughs> now we don't even have that. <laughs> I know. Well, Mr. Coloma, it's interesting you bring that up. As a first-generation son of an immigrant, my, my parents immigrated in 1964 to America. In fact, uh, when they were coming over from Sicily, they were supposed to come here in 63, but John F. Kennedy was shot and assassinated, and that delayed their entrance to the country for a uh, uh, for about three or four months in March of 64. And, you know, again, being this rich tradition of, of Catholic Sicily with our feast days and our cultures and our language, you know, I understand what deep culture means because it goes back to our faith ultimately. Yeah. But as Americans, I've always asked, as born and raised in this country, like you, Mr. Colomb, I love this country. It is the country of my birth. It is the country that has nurtured me. It is the country that has protected me. But I still don't know what American culture actually is. Is it apple pie? Is it the NFL? Is it baseball? What is American culture, Mr. Colon? Well, the answer, to be brutally frank, is twofold. One, there is a certain shallowness to the country, which is because we're a young country. There isn't a single American culture. There are a lot of them. Uh, the South, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, there are places. That's the first answer. And some of these happen to be Catholic. Southern Louisiana, northern New Mexico, parts of the Pennsylvania Dutch country, southern Maryland. You will, There are integrally, culturally Catholic enclaves in the United States, but they're just enclaves. What is the bigger picture? The bigger American culture? Well, yeah, baseball, apple pie, Washington Irving, Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ray Bradbury. Um, yeah. It's And it's not, and this is the thing that I'm, I'm at pains to mention, it's not great, uh, but it's not bad. You know, as I say, we invented the polio vaccine. We invented the cocktail. Nobody else did that. We invented the Broadway musical. But would it ever bring us together as a people? Our Catholic faith in my Sicilian culture, Italian culture, that's what brings a nation, a culture, a community, a family together. But do those values bring Americans together? Not yet. But you've got to remember those values didn't bring Sicilians together 1,500, 1,700, 1,800 years ago. True. Sure. You've got to understand, you and your family were at the tail end of a long, long history. Great point. But if you'd been there in, say, oh, I don't know, 476, when there were still pagan districts in Sicily, trust me. And you got to remember, too, taking Sicily as an example, this is an area that's very mixed ethnically because of successive invasions. Uh, king Roger, the, the um, Norman king of Sicily, he had to have five different languages uh, used at his court. Greeks, Italians, uh, Lombards, Normans, and Muslims, you know, Arabs. Uh, so it didn't stop that way. And, you know, if you had been living at the court of King Roger of Sicily, you would have said, my gosh, what, what, what are we ever going to do with these people? They're crazy. But give it a few, give it the faith and give it a few centuries and you get yeah. what you have now. See, this is what you've got to understand about America. We are at the beginning, unless it breaks apart. Right. You know, uh, Burgundy is not with us. And I don't mean the Grand Duchy. I mean the Burgundian tribe. The Franks survived, uh, but the Burgundians did not, not as, a, as an entity. Uh, it may be that that's our fate. I don't know. You you see, you can only do what you could do. That's right. Uh, you, again, to use the, the simile, if you were at King Roger's court, you've only got one lifetime. 
you can't make the uh, the remaining Sicilian Muslims and the Sicilian Jews and all that Catholic. You can't come to some sort of modus operandi, which they did, which would allow Greeks and Latins to coexist in Sicily. And they still do. There's still Eastern Rite towns in Sicily, and they get along pretty well with their Latin Rite neighbors. But that was a modus vivendi that it's not like somebody sat around and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to plan it out like that. No. These things happen over a long period of time. But they don't happen unless they get started. <laughs> and the problem, of course, is that if you're in a position where if you do anything, you're starting it. You have no way of knowing where it's going to end because the end is going to be in 500 years or 1,000 years. You don't know. So, what you so, we're back, so we're back to square one, though, and that is the faith evangelizing America. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. You see, politics, there is no political solution for our country ultimately. Why? Because politics rests on culture. The politics can only be healthy if the culture is healthy. But there's a problem with that. Culture rests on religion. The culture can't be ha healthy unless the religious basis of the nation is healthy. And that can only be true if the religion of the nation is true. Otherwise, otherwise we're in for uh, unpleasantries. So, I mean, and don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't short-term political solutions that might be more helpful than not. I'm not saying that. Of course there are. What I am saying, though, is that if you trust to politics or even to culture for national salvation, you will be very disappointed. And you do have to think in the long term. If you ask yourself, well, gee, what can I do? Well, I don't know. What, what was St. Peter and the other, uh, the other uh, 11 apostles supposed to do? Go out and convert the world, he said. Ha! 12 plus the 72 disciples? Well, you know, because they were filled with the faith. Every one of them went someplace and did something. Now, that something was a little seed in England, a little seed in Spain, a little seed in Italy, a little seed here, a little seed there. From uh, uh, England to India. But, but it grew. And in 300 years, it was so big, it enveloped the Roman Empire. But if what you want out of me is a how do we fix everything now and restore everything to what I remember in my childhood, the answer is in the, to be found, uh, <laughs> the answer is to be found in the words of your great fellow ethnic Perry Como, who tells us, but that was once upon a time and once upon a time never comes again. The America that I was born into, the America of the, the Pledge of Allegiance, the, the American Legion, the Knights of Columbus, the Boy Scouts. Yes, I was an Eagle Scout. Fourth degree Knight of Columbus. Yep, yep, yep. That America is deader than Austria-Hungary. Yeah. So I don't like that. I don't like Austria-Hungary being dead either. But we live in the world we live in. So what we have to do is pick up whatever pieces we find in our immediate neighborhood and do whatever we can with them. And it may be, especially the way things are going, that we may literally or figuratively lose our heads over it. But reflect on this too. And that is that the time in which God decided you would be born is simply the historic backdrop against which you and yours have to work out your salvation. And if we make it to heaven, then all of this will have been worth it. Yep. And if not, if not, then it doesn't matter who wins, not to us. Andrew, you got a question for Mr. Colon? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess if you're trying to figure out which pieces to pick up first. Um... That's a real good question. <laughs> <laughs> are, you... Are, are you, a certain amount of you has to be a, a psychologist in the good sense. And, and yeah. I guess 
a, a doctor and and assess each person in front of you to see what is uh you know what is it that they need in order to to fix what looks to me to more or less be a psychological problem right i mean we're we're if and i'm kind of hearkening back to your earlier conversation about american exceptionalism and the para religion um it's it's almost it's almost as if we're denying that dogma exists but that's we're treating that as if it's a dogma like, Correct. right the only tr- the only objective truth that we are, can all recognize that we all should recognize that there is no such thing as objective truth that what's Correct. really important is each individual's story you know each individual's emotions that's what's important that's what we really need to be focusing our time on and and it's almost like that's it's so close to the truth that it's incredibly dangerous Right, well, like you, you should have an incredible amount of attention focused on that person in front of you, and and where their emotions are. But that's not the first truth. That that, that is not the thing that matters most. No, but what you've got to do is use that knowledge, in order to get the fact that there is objective truth across to them. And believe you me, no matter how self-deluded people can be. They don't like to be robbed. They don't like to be the uh, well. Uh, once you find what their real objective reality is, that's what you build on. The only reason why we have um, uh, why we have uh, the concept of anything from police to private property is because of the faith. And in fa- in fact. That the notion that there is no objective truth, which, as you correctly say, runs through everything, you have to show them how that notion really is to their disadvantage. Mm. Uh, the problem is when you're dealing with people who don't believe in anything but themselves, you've got to start out with why what you believe really is to their benefit to look into. Because it provides a, a reason. Well, let, let me put it this way. Uh, when the faith came to Rome, the first two social classes that really got eaten up by the faith, just dived into it, were ironically the two extremes, the slaves and the old Roman nobility, the, the pre-imperial nobility, uh, who had been sort of shunted aside with the rise of the empire. These were the two groups that went Catholic the most quickly. Now, you know, you'd ask yourself, well, why would they do that? Especially because, you know, they're, they're nothing like each other, the opposite ends of the spectrum. You're right, they are. But each had a different reason for it. In the case of the slaves, it's because the faith gave their life, their lives meaning and importance. They weren't just property. They were human beings. They were children of God. For the old Roman nobility, who had prided themselves on avoiding the uh, uh, the perversion and, and decadence uh, that Rome had fallen into. It gave their uh, adherence to the quote-unquote old Roman virtues a supernatural aspect. In a certain sense, it did for them what it did for the slaves. It gave, it gave their subjective uh, reasonings objective reality. And that, I think there's a clue for us all in that, uh, G.K. Chesterton said that the, f- the first thing that, you know, he had loved myths and fairy tales and all that when he was a kid. Uh, and the thing that finally dawned on him about Christianity was that it was all that stuff, only more exciting and real. Well, mutatis mutandis, every degree of man or one you're going to run into has something like that going on. The trick is to find out what it is and then use it as an opening for the faith, for the preparatio evangelium. Uh, and that varies from people to people. I mean, there's a reason why the very best uh, anthropological and ethnographic collections were made by missionaries because they got to know the people that they were going to serve among very well 
and then they presented the, uh, the faith to them in their own terms. Uh, you know, California, St. Renipero Serra, he was a master of that. Uh, he, um, he knew how to do it. And the, the funny thing, when he came to San Luis Obispo for the first time, which was not built up by then, they're not being a mission yet, he set up a wooden framework and began ringing bells and shouting at the top of his voice, Oh, come to the church of God, ye Gentiles, come. And the commander of the Spanish troops with him said, Why are you doing that? Nobody's going to understand you. And he said, I can't help it. My heart is full of our Lord. But they did come. And among them was a very, very old lady who said that when she was a little girl, her grandfather had told her, that a man would come in a gray robe to tell her the truth. And that when that man came, she had to follow whatever he said to do. And then she said, here you are. Now, that would never have happened if he hadn't rung the bell. You see, evangelization, uh, I have to point out, is not always about us and our calculations. You also have to allow room for the Holy Ghost and his movement, not just in you, but in the people you're trying to evangelize. Yeah, okay. Uh, Julian, um, you got a final question for Mr. Colon? Unmute yourself there, buddy. Okay, well, uh, Julian uh, is having some difficulties here. I guess, you know, Mr. Colomb, um, you know, as we start... Am I unmuted? Up, uh, there you go. Yeah, you're unmuted. You got, a, you got a final question, Mr. Colomb? Yeah. Um, so to take it back to patriotism, what you were saying before, it dawned on me that nobody ever pays attention to... St. Thomas Aquinas's virtue, uh, how he explains patriotism. Catholics have bought hook, line, and sinker the Enlightenment, specifically the American version of patriotism, and have completely disregarded uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's idea of what patriotism is. And if they do have a, a somewhat of a working knowledge of St. Thomas Aquinas's definition of and what patriotism is it, it's quickly morphs into 18th century americanism version of patriotism and that somehow you have to love the government and work with the government even though this government it, it, it's it, it's not something that a catholic should want but yet somehow they constantly keep trying to baptize it why is it that I guess, like liberalism, that Catholics have embraced this 18th century American idea of patriotism and completely disregarded the actual Catholic ideal of patriotism. Well, as I say, uh, most of the hierarchy were pushing this to the very beginning. You know, uh, John Carroll accompanied, um, Father John Carroll accompanied Benjamin Franklin to uh, Quebec in an attempt to get the French Canadians to join the revolution. Now, the problem with that was that the Continental Congress had sent out two letters, one to the people of Canada and the other to the people of Britain. Well, to the people of Canada, the letter said that uh, surely you will not, not allow our religious differences, which uh, you know they, we have as the same love of freedom, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, they sent a letter to the people of Britain that attacked the king for the Quebec Act, saying that he has established in Quebec uh, that religion which has uh, uh, bathed your islands in blood. Hmm. Well, unfortunately for Franklin and Carroll, Bishop Briot of Quebec had gotten copies of both letters. Well, when they got up there, he ordered that any priest who sheltered them would be suspended. Now, the one who did was. But he excommunicated John Carroll. And that's why when John Carroll was eventually appointed Bishop of Baltimore, he had to go to England to be consecrated because mm -hmm. he couldn't set foot in the Diocese of Quebec. 
Well, the thing is that when Pius VI decided that uh, America needed a bishop in 1789, he first applied to George Washington as the president and asked him uh, who he would like as uh, bishop. And Washington's response was, appoint whoever you like. That, you know, it's it's not within our, our purview. So then he asked Benjamin Franklin, who was kind of a superstar in Europe, the best known American over there. And he suggested John Carroll, which suggestion Pius VI took. So someone asked Ben Franklin, why did you suggest Father Carroll? And his response was, because on all the months we were together on the Quebec trip, going up there and coming back, he never once talked about religion. Now, that, with, with some very fine exceptions, that has been pretty much the standard for the American hierarchy from that day to this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you, you know, you cannot expect more out of the sheep than you're going to get out of the shepherds. Or to uh, put it the way that uh, Chaucer's Parson says it, if gold should rust, what can poor iron do? Yep, exactly. Well, Mr. Colombo, I think this this is in essence um, the challenge we Catholics have faced in America. And uh, while we love our country, without a doubt, and it's been a blessing to us in a lot of different ways, without a doubt, I think we're all struggling to find our place, especially in what appears this great apostasy that we're all living through. But I also like to remind everybody, it's not just America that the apostasy is sweeping through. It's also throughout the entire globe. Yeah. And so when we kind of look at what's going on in the world, you know, listen, one of the things that I keep hearing in Catholic circles, and I wrap it up with this, Mr. Colomb, today, is that many Catholics are telling me that if Joe Biden is elected, again, going back to the election, and if we have a complete Marxist takeover of the country, because that's the fear that they're going to move to Poland and Hungary in order to get away from this, because Poland has declared Christ as king, Our Lady as the Queen of Heaven. Hungary is very religious and trying to fight off the force of liberalism, but I keep her reminding them they are democracies and the the, the the liberal forces are trying to go in there and in a day and age where the church is effectively weak in the midst of a crisis i guess my question for you is those fellow catholic of ours that are considering moving to poland and hungary will poland fall like all other western democracies have well she's in a bad way at the moment you know the uh the courts moved against abortion and the uh the other side erupted now, what's going to come out of that? We're watching carefully. I don't know. Um, certainly, Central Europe is resisting. Now, what form, how long that's going to last, whether they'll be successful, I can't say. What I can say is that there's kind of a race to the bottom in the sense that our country, which is really, I mean, if it weren't for us, George Soros wouldn't have the money he has. Uh yeah. You know, you can only uh, you can only sell so much uh, property stolen from dead Jewish people, and that where he got his start. You know, uh, he made his money really in the states, and we're we're the backers of all bad things. But with our implosion, with the uh, increasing Islamic problem in uh, Western Europe, how are things going to go over here? I don't know. Uh, but if I were uh, if I were there right now in the states. I would say, see, look around your own place, see what you can do where you are, you know, and if you absolutely can't, fine, but see what you can do where you are. And you know, my, my little joke, uh, <laughs> you hear all these celebrities saying that they were going to leave the States if Trump were elected. Well, I never said that I would leave the States if Biden were elected, and yet here I am in Austria. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, you, they're all still sitting over there. I, I'm actually gone. I, I, I don't know what to yeah. say. But uh, yeah. no, uh, honestly, had I known two years ago the way things were going to be, I don't tell you that I would have done anything different. But I'll tell you what, I would have been very, very, very shocked at how quickly things went south. Uh but, you know, we've got to remember once again, God is in charge. It's not all about us, except about our salvation. 
Uh, remember, too, that there are three things you can do of against persecution that the church allows. You can be martyred. You can take up arms against it. You can flee. Now, the most perfect is martyrdom. The most heroic is resistance. But flight, you know, flight is flight. It's not wrong. It's just the least perfect of the three. Yep. Yep. I think it's yeah. very well said, Mr. Colom. I think, you know, for my part, you know, being born and raised in this country, having the love for this country myself, I think, um, you know, I've chosen to stay here and fight the good fight. I realize some of the risks here for my future offspring and my family and things of that nature. But we are Americans and it's our duty. And I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Colom. I think evangelization is the key to this thing. As difficult as it is with the church in crisis, I believe that's part of the issue. You know, when I ask you about Poland and Hungary and, and sort of the encroaching liberalism there, you know, a lot of people say, well, look at look at Ireland. You know, they had the Trinity enshrined in the Constitution and it collapsed. But oh. I go back to, I think, something you said. you got to have a functioning church in place that believes in its mission, administering the sacraments and the graces that the church has. I think that's not a great example. Uh, that yeah. Going. yeah, I mean, it's it's a hard it's a hard time, but there have been hard times in history before, and our ancestors lived through them, and we know this yep. because we're here. Uh, you know, when people say to me, "Well, how could we possibly bring children into a world this terrible?" Uh, my response is, "Well, gee, I, I guess the way our our ancestors did it during the Black Death." Yeah, and we know they did, and you know how we know they did. Even if you don't know your genealogy, you know how we know your ancestors had kids during the Black Death? How's that? How's that? Well, I'm not telling. It's a secret. you got to figure it out on your own. All right. Fair enough. My, uh, sure. I... Exactly. My, you know, what? <laughs> one of my jokes is that, uh, you know, these hereditary organizations like the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the Confederate Veterans, all, the, all these hereditary organizations. I've uh, long said that I'm going to start the most inclusive hereditary organization there has ever been. I'm going to call it the Hereditary Order of the Sons and Daughters of the Black Plague. If you descend from a survivor, you can join. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's terrible. All my ancestors died in the plague. Not one survived. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I know. I, I, I'll tell you if you ever if you find yourself in that position, there's not much I can do to help you. I really can't. I but know. Like, like the old uh, the old <laughs> Irishman said, uh, "It's hereditary in my family to have no children." <laughs> okay. All right. Well, very well said, Mr. Cologne. Listen, I want to thank you for joining us. It, it is truly an honor to get to talk to you. Um, uh, we're big fans of yours around here. Uh, I want to thank Julian, Julian here for connecting uh, us to you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Julian is uh, going to get things going on his end here. Andrew, thanks for, for, for showing up as well, too, today. You did great. And uh, I want to thank our audience for tuning in. Uh, we're going to have this up on the Knights of Christendom website as well, too. We'll probably chop it up. There's lots of great little nuggets in this. And once again, Mr. <laughs> Cologne. You can find his books on Amazon. You can find his show off the menu right on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, I was a history major in college, and uh, I learned more from Mr. Cologne, seriously, watching his show off the menu than I ever did in college. I got, you know, just, you know, being taught by leftist professors in the, in the trade of history, nothing more frustrating. If you want a sense of sanity and, uh, uh, and truth for that matter, check out Mr. Cologne, read his books, watch his show. Thank you, Mr. Charles Cologne. Thank you very much. Glad to help always. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you. God bless, God bless you all. Take all care. right, this is Frank signing off for the Knights of Christian. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Julian. We'll talk to you guys later. Good night, everybody. Good.